On March 8th, 2002, Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon, the very first Yu-Gi-Oh! booster set for the TCG, was released in America. The set featured many iconic cards from the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, like Dark Magician and Blue Eyes White Dragon, and even some cards that are still powerful to this day, like Raigeki and Pot of Greed. Missing are the complicated effects and strategies that would dominate the modern metagame. This is a Yu-Gi-Oh! where monsters attack and defense matter, and where games go for many turns. While the game may not be very complex at this point, there is a simple joy in the slower back and forth matches that using this card pool provides. Both players whittling down their opponent's life points with one attack at a time. Ah, yep, these are simpler times, more pure than the modern version of the game. After all, it's not like you can make any sort of degenerate strategy with such a limited card pool, or... Welcome to YGO From Zero, your source for guides on Yu-Gi-Oh's past formats. Today we're starting at the very beginning, with the very first set released, Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon. But before we dive into the individual cards and strategies that define this first format, I want to instruct new players on the rules of the game as they were at the time. I know that many of you already know this stuff, so if you want to skip past this, go to the timestamp posted on the screen. But for everyone else, let's do a quick breakdown of the rules of the game. Okay, before we get into the actual strategies and decks and gameplay, let's cover some basic rules first. Uh, this is for if you've never played the game in your life and you're interested in it. Uh, I'm here to explain the basic rules, uh, what the game's all about, and hopefully it will be good enough uh, to understand how to play. Uh, if it's not, I'll also put a link to a rulebook for the game in the description. Uh, just know that the rulebook will also have probably some extraneous information that uh, will not apply to this format specifically. But in Yu-Gi-Oh, it's a fight between two players. It's not a cooperative card game. It's competitive. Uh, each player starts out with a deck of at least 40 cards and each player also starts out with 8,000 life points. Now the way to win the game is either to deplete your opponent's life points to zero, uh, to make it so that they run out of cards to draw. So if a player needs to draw a card from their deck, but they can't, then they actually lose the game. Uh, and that's called deck out. That's the name of that win condition or to win through some alternate win condition, which uh, I'll get to later, but there's only one of in this format. Now, the deck is made up of cards, as I said, and these cards have different types. The most important type, arguably, is that of the monster. Now, there are two types of monsters, normal monsters, which have a light yellow border, and effect monsters, which have more of an orangey border. Whether they're effect monsters or normal monsters, though, every monster card has certain information on it that is shared among all types of monsters. So, firstly, you'll notice at the top of the card is the name. So, for instance, this card's name is Red Eyes Black Dragon. Next to the name is something called an attribute. So, if Red Eyes Black Dragon, for example, is dark. It is the dark attribute, which can be hard to see, um, but don't worry, it doesn't matter at this point. It has no bearing on the gameplay right now. Just view it as a bit of flavor text. Under the name and the attribute are a number of stars, and these stars are equal to the monster's level. For instance, there are seven stars here, so Red Eyes Black Dragon is a level seven monster. Under the monster's level is a nice little picture of that monster. Uh, this has no bearing on the gameplay whatsoever. But it's nice to see. Adds a bit of flavor. At the very bottom of the card uh, are two numbers, one of which is labeled ATK, the other which is labeled DEF. The first is attack, and the second is defense. Now, these numbers are used when calculating what happens when two monsters fight each other, which in Yu-Gi-Oh! is called battle. Um, and I'll get to that later, exactly how that's calculated. But as you can see here, Red Eyes Black Dragon has 2,400 attack and 2,000 defense. 
Now, above this, above the attack and defense, is the description box for the card. Uh, so, for a normal monster, this just has a bit of flavor text. So, here we learn that Red Eyes Black Dragon is a ferocious dragon with a deadly attack. Uh, with effect monsters, this will be an effect, which we'll get to shortly. But before we do, I want to point out this little thing in brackets here that says dragon. Uh, that word in brackets is a monster's type. Now, a type is sort of like a classification for the card. Uh, and it does actually have some gameplay ramifications with certain effects, only affecting certain types of monsters. Um, but we'll get to those later. Now that we've covered the basic card information for a monster card on a normal monster, let's show you what an effect monster looks like. So here we've got Manier Bug, an effect monster. We see its name up here. We see that its attribute is Earth. It has two stars, so it's level two. Its attack is 450, and its defense is 600. And it is an insect monster. It also has this little signifier effect right here. Uh, now, the flip we won't worry about just yet, uh, but it's another sort of deg uh, it's another sort of signifier for a monster. Um, but let's discuss what this effect actually means, uh, and this will apply to pretty much every effect that you can come across in Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, so this is a very important lesson, and it may seem complicated right now, but once you get it hammered down, uh, it's very very simple. So effects in Yu-Gi-Oh are broken up into at most three different sections. One of which is before a colon, uh, the second of which is between a colon and a semicolon, and then the third of which is after a semicolon. Now, not all effects actually are written like this. For instance, there are much simpler effects like on the spell card that says just draw two cards, but we'll get to that later. Um, if you can understand how an effect that's split up into all three parts like this works, then you can understand how any other effect in the game works, basically. So let's just break down what each of these sections means. So the part before the colon is the activation conditions on the card. So here it just says flip, which is sort of a keyword. And what flip means is when this monster is flipped from face down to face up. Uh, so since this says flip, that means that this effect activates when this monster is flipped from face down position to face up position. So now we know when the effect is activated. The second part tells us what we need to do before the effect actually activates. So uh, the part before the semicolon says target one monster on the field. Target just is fancy word for select. So what happens when Manier Bug is flipped face up is that you target, you select one monster on the field. Uh, then after this happens, uh, the last part actually tells us what the effect does when it resolves, when it actually uh, happens. Uh, so Manier Bug says that it destroys the monster that it targets. So, all told, this effect reads, when this card's flipped face up, you target one monster on the field, and you destroy that target. You might be wondering why there's a separation between targeting the monster on the field and destroying it. That's because there actually is a window to respond to this effect with trap cards, which we'll get to later. Uh, but the actual way that works is kind of complicated. So I'll save that for another section of the video. But for now, just know that that is how effects in Yu-Gi-Oh are broken down into these three parts. And once you can read something like that, uh, you can read and understand any effect in the game. Moving on from monsters, we have the next big type of card, which is a spell card. Now spell cards are green and they have a lot less information on them than monsters. But there are also more types of spell cards than there are for monsters. So, uh, a spell card is a card that has just an effect. So you play it and you gain that effect and then you remove it from the field that you play it on. Uh, so for instance, Pot of Greed here, when you play it, you draw two cards and that's all it does. Uh, Pot of Greed is what's known as a normal spell card. 
because there are no uh, extra symbols on it, no other frills. It's just pot of greed. Um, so it's a normal spell card, and most spell cards in the game are normal spell cards. Uh, moving on from them, though, we have the next type of spell card, which is an equipped spell card. Now, equipped spell cards also get an effect when they're activated, but they also need a face-up monster on the field of a given type to be activated. For instance, in order to activate Dragon Treasure, you need to have a face-up monster like Red Eyes Black Dragon, which is a dragon on the field to activate it. And when you activate an equip spell, you do something called equip it onto a monster, which means that you target one monster that meets its activation conditions, and you apply its effect to that monster. Uh, if that monster is removed from the field at any point after activating the equip spell, then the equip spell is destroyed and it leaves the field. Um, but while it is equipped to that monster, it stays on the field until that monster does leave the field. Um, so for instance, if you equip Dragon Treasure to Red Eyes and Red Eyes was destroyed some way, then Dragon Treasure would also be destroyed. Um, but while it's active, it gives the equipped monster a buff. In this case, it increases the attack and defense of the monster by 300 points. Now, equip spells are what's known as a continuous effect because it continually applies while it's on the field. Uh, another sort of spell card that's a continuous effect is that of a field spell card, which are, are shown by this little compass rose up here, just like the equip spells are shown by this little cross up here. Now, field spell cards uh, also apply buffs to certain types of monsters. So, for instance, if Mountain was on the field when Red Eyes was on the field, then Red Eyes would gain 200 attack and defense because Red Eyes is a dragon type monster. However, when you activate a field spell, you don't have to equip it to a certain monster. The field spell card just goes in its own special zone on the field and remains active until it is destroyed or removed from the field. So there can only be one active field spell on the field at a time. So if you have a field spell active and your opponent activates a field spell of their own, your field spell will be destroyed uh, and their field spell will take precedence. Um, as a note, uh, you can set a field spell while another field spell is active on the field um, without destroying that field spell as long as it isn't your own. So if your opponent has a mountain on their side of the field, you can set a mountain of your own and your opponent's mountain will still remain active. Field spells also stay on the field uh, until they're destroyed or leave the field for whatever reason. Uh, so they are continuous effects just like equip spells. Now that we've covered the different types of spell cards, let's get into the last type of card, which are traps. Now traps have this pinkish purplish border here, uh, and trap cards are unique among all other cards in the game in that they can actually be activated during your opponent's turn. Uh, and they can also be activated in response to certain effects uh, being activated. In technical terms, this means that they have a higher spell speed as all other uh, card effects in the game. But we won't really be using this term yet because there are no other cards with that, uh, with that designation. So trap cards are unique in that uh, they're the only cards that can activate in response to a trap card uh, or in response to something on your opponent's turn. Now, there are two types of trap cards. One is a normal trap card. So for instance, Trap Hole is a normal trap card and it can only be activated in response to a certain thing happening. So for instance, it can only be activated when your opponent normal or flip summons a monster with a thousand or more attack. Uh, we'll get more into summoning later on, but as you see from when we learned about the different sections of an effect, when we talked about Man Eater Bug, uh, this can only be activated at a certain point. So after a normal trap card is activated and its effect resolves, it leaves the field. 
but there is a type of trap card that actually stays on the field after it is activated and resolved, and that is a continuous trap card. Now, continuous trap cards have this little infinity sign up here, which means that once they're activated, they remain face up on the field until they're destroyed in some way or forced to leave the field. Uh, and continuous trap cards, just like field spell cards and equip spell cards, have their effects active uh, for as long as they're face up on the field. And that covers all the different types of cards pretty much in the game. There is one more type of monster called a fusion monster, but I won't get to that yet. I'll get to that later, uh, what exactly those are. Just know that fusion monsters are kept in a special deck outside of your main deck called an extra deck. And since the extra deck is outside of the main deck, they can be accessed at any time as long as there's the right conditions to access them. But we'll get into what those conditions actually are much later on. So we've talked about the main deck, which is you know your 40 card deck that you bring into the game. We've talked about the extra deck, which is where you keep your fusion monsters. Uh, and there's one more deck we need to talk about, and that's the side deck. Now the side deck is a set of 15 cards that uh, if you're playing a match, so like a best of three, where you play three games and whoever wins two of those games wins the entire match, then after game one, you're allowed to swap in cards from your sideboard, from your side deck with cards in your main deck. Uh, now you can't just add the cards in your side deck to the main deck. You actually have to do exchanges. So uh, going into games two and three, if you swap cards from your side deck in, you should have the same number of cards in, in the deck that you're using as you started out with in game one. Um, the side deck can be useful in terms of counteracting specific strategies that your opponent may have, and you can keep cards in it that uh, would serve that benefit well, that would serve that purpose well. And at this point in the game's history, you can only have either 15 cards in the side deck or no side deck at all. So that's something that changes later on in the game. And I don't really think it matters too, too much because you want to max out on cards in your side deck anyways. So it's not like you'd want to have 10 cards versus 15. Just so you can be prepared for as many situations as possible. But at this point in the game's history, you know, it's just a quirky little thing. You have to have 15 cards in your side deck or you, you don't have a side deck at all. Now that we've talked about the specific cards in the different decks that you have, let's actually discuss the field that these cards are played on and the structure of a given turn. Okay, now that we've discussed the types of cards that we play in our decks, uh, let's go into what the actual field that we play on looks like and the basic structure of a turn. So you'll see here that we play on a symmetrical field and each side of the field has 10 zones. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, arranged in a rectangle and then has two zones adjacent to them. Uh, and then each side of the field also has a deck zone. Uh, and if we were actually playing against another person, there'd be a deck right here. And also an extra deck zone. Uh, and again, uh, the other person's extra deck would be right there. And the extra deck zone is where you place the extra deck, which includes fusion monsters. So at the start of the game, each player starts by drawing five cards. Then, at the start of their turn, which is called the draw phase, each player draws a card. Now, each turn is separated up into multiple phases, and they go one into the other. So after the draw phase uh, comes the standby phase. Also, as a note, in the draw phase, after a card is drawn, uh, either player can activate trap cards if that trap card's already on the field. Like, let's say, we had already had this dragon capture draw face down on the field, and then it was the start of our opponent's turn or the start of our turn. The card was drawn, 
uh, then we could activate Dragon Capture Jar, just like that. Um, but we don't. So then we move on to the standby phase after the draw phase. Uh, now in the standby phase, each player has the chance to activate trap cards that are already on the field that uh, can be activated. So again, if we had this Dragon Capture Jar face down on the field already, we could activate it in the standby phase. But if neither player has effects that they want to activate in this phase, we move to the main phase. And the main phase is where a lot of uh, what we do happens. So there are a couple things you can do in the main phase. The first is that you can activate spell cards. So for instance, we can activate Pot of Greed, draw two cards. You can activate as many spell cards as you are able to in one turn. So we can activate another Pot of Greed like this. Um, we can activate a field spell, Mountain, just like that. Uh, you can just activate as many as you want. And also, as a note, spell cards can be activated in the turn that they are set face down, just like that. Now, you play or set spell and trap cards in these bottom five rows here, which are known as the spell and trap card uh, zones. So, for instance, if we want to set Dragon Capture Jar, we can set it in any one of these zones alongside Swords Revealing Light. Now, if we want to do stuff with monsters, we're a bit more limited. Each turn, we're allowed to normal summon or set one monster from our hand. Uh, a normal summon or set just means if we want to summon it, we bring it out in face up attack position like that. And if we want to set it, what we would do is we could bring it down in face down defense position just like that. And monsters are always summoned in the monster zones, which are these five zones right here that are above the spell and trap card zones. As a note, when we activated that field spell earlier, that went in the field spell zone, which is right next to the monster zones. You'll also notice right next to the monster zones is what is known as the graveyard. And the graveyard is where cards go when they're destroyed or when their effects activate and resolve, and they're not continuous. So for instance, uh, if we activated a Dragon Capture Jar, uh, that would not go to the grave because that is continuous, just like if we activated Fieldspell Mountain, that would not go to the graveyard since it is a continuous effect. Um, but if we activate like a Pot of Greed, then that would go to the graveyard after it is done resolving. Uh, in addition, uh, if we, for instance, wanted to summon out a Curse of Dragon for our normal summon, we would not be able just to summon it out just like that for no cost. Um, oops. Because uh, Curse of Dragon has above four stars. So whenever you normal summon or set a monster with four or lower stars, you don't have to pay any cost or anything like that. So for instance, we can summon out Skull Redbird, no problem. However, if we want to summon out a level five or six monster like Curse of Dragon, we actually have to offer up one of our monsters already on the field as a tribute. So for instance, if this Skull Redbird had been summoned last turn, uh, then what we could do is we could tribute it to normal summon or normal set a Curse of Dragon. And this is known as a Tribute Summon. In addition, uh, if we have a monster with higher than six stars, so for instance, Blue Eyes White Dragon, which is eight stars, that actually needs two tributes to be summoned. So we would have to have two monsters on the field already at the beginning of our turn or just at some point in the turn without having normal summoned. And we would have to offer both of them as tribute to tribute summon or tribute set a blue eyes white dragon. So normal summons, you can only do one of per turn. So normal summons, you can only do one of per turn, 
but there are actually two other types of summons that you can do as many times as you are able. The first of these is called a flip summon. So for instance, if you already had some monsters face down set like this on the field and they hadn't been set that turn, you're allowed to flip them to face up attack position like that and that is called a flip summon. And you can do as many flip summons as you are able to per turn. Uh, so it's not like the normal summon. Another type of summon that you're able to do as many times as you want to per turn is a special summon. A special summon is when a monster is summoned out by a card effect. For instance, Monster Reborn has the effect that says target one monster in either graveyard and special summon it. So, if we activate Monster Reborn and target Blue Eyes, we can summon it with the effect of Monster Reborn. And even though it's a level 8 monster, we don't have to tribute to summon it because this isn't a tribute summon, this is a special summon. In addition, because we summoned Blue Eyes with a special summon, we still haven't used up our normal summon this turn. So we could still summon Skull Redbird if we wanted to, or we could have set Skull Redbird as well with our normal set. Now, as a note, if a monster is already on the field at the start of the turn, uh, you are allowed to change its battle position once per turn uh, in the main phase. So for instance, if this Skull Redbird had been on the field, had been summoned last turn, for instance, uh, then in our main phase, we could switch it to defense if we want. But we can't then switch it back to attack afterwards. Uh, you can change the battle position of however many monsters that you want to and are, that are eligible to change the battle position of per turn. So for instance, if we had also already had this giant soldier of stone in defense position at the start of our turn, we could have we could switch it to attack if we want to in the main phase. But again, we can't then switch it back later. Um, during the first turn of the game, uh, you are not allowed to enter the battle phase, which would normally follow the main phase one. Uh, I will discuss the battle phase later because it's a bit more complicated than these other phases. But after the battle phase is done, we go into main phase two. Now in main phase two, you can do uh, all the things that you could do in main phase one. Uh, if you had already normal summoner set, you can't do another normal summoner set. But if you haven't yet, you can do it in main phase two if you want to. Uh, as a note, the one thing that you can't really do in main phase two, as you could have in main phase one, is if one of your monsters has attacked this turn, you can't then change the battle position of it in main phase two, even if you hadn't already changed the battle position this turn. After the main phase two, we go to the end phase. And in the end phase, again, if either player has trap cards that can be activated at this time, they are allowed to activate them. Um, but if not, uh, at the end of the turn, you count up how many cards are in your hand. And if you have more than six cards in your hand, like let's say we had, uh, let's say we had seven cards in our hand. If we had, if we had seven cards in our hand, we'd have to discard a card to the graveyard to get down to six cards in our hand. Um, and likewise, if we had eight cards in our hand, we'd have to discard two cards to get down to six, and so on and so forth. And then, after the discard at the end of our turn, we officially end our turn, and it becomes our opponent's turn. And they're able to go through the same sort of phases, uh, except if it is not the first turn, they can do the battle phase. Now let's discuss what happens in the battle phase. Uh, I've chosen to separate this from the discussion of the rest of the turn because the battle phase is a little bit more complicated than the other phases. So I've chosen to separate it into its own section and also chosen to simplify the game state by getting rid of all the hands and just putting down monsters. Um, so the battle phase, unlike other phases, is actually made up of multiple parts itself. The first step is called the start step of the battle phase, in which the turn player declares that they're entering the battle phase. 
Drop effects can be activated in the start step uh, if they are if they meet their activation requirements. For instance, you could activate a dragon capture jar, let's say, in the start step. The next step after the start step is called the battle step. Now in the battle step, the turn player can declare attacks with their monsters or move to the end step of the battle phase, which means they're leaving the battle phase. Uh, in this step, uh, effects can be activated, again, if they meet their activation conditions. Uh, so you can activate something like a dragon capture jar or a two-pronged attack. Um, but in most cases, uh, in this format at least, there won't really be effects that can activate to do that. As a note, if a player declares an attack with a monster and the number of monsters on their opponent's side of the field changes for some reason when that, once that attack has been declared, the turn player is then able to choose whether they want to keep attacking with that monster or instead attack with another monster. And if they choose to attack with another monster, they can then attack with their original monster later in that turn. This is called replay, and it can only occur in this format if someone uses two-pronged attack once an attack is declared. And so it is very, very unlikely to come up, but it can come up, so I figured that I'd mention it here. But most of the time, when a monster declares an attack, then the, the turn will go directly into the damage step. So when the damage step is entered, no effects can be activated. So for instance, if we're in the damage step with Skull Redbird attacking uh, Witty Phantom, then at this point, the opponent can't activate two-pronged attack to destroy Skull Redbird because it's too late. It's in the damage step. In the damage step, uh, there are multiple different sub-steps of the damage step, but they're all irrelevant for us at this point, pretty much. But basically, uh, if the attack is a direct attack to the opponent's life points, not attacking a monster, then the opponent just takes a damage equal to the monster's attack and loses that much life points. If a monster in attack mode attacks another monster in attack mode, then... Uh, the, the attacks of the two monsters are compared. Uh, whichever, uh, whichever monster has the lower attack is destroyed in that interaction. And it's destroyed by battle. That's what it's called when it's destroyed that way. And the player controlling that monster with the lower amount of attack takes damage equal to the difference in the attacks of the two monsters. So for instance, if Skull Redbird attacked Woody Phantom, then... The turn the, then the player who controlled Woody Phantom would take 150 life points, which is the difference between the two attacks, and Woody Phantom would be destroyed. Now, if a monster in attack position attacks another monster in attack position that has the same attack points as the attacking monster, like if these two Eurabies attacked each other, then both would be destroyed and neither player would take any damage from that encounter. Now, if a monster in attack mode attacks a monster in defense mode that has lower defense than that monster's attack, like if Giant Soldier Stone attacks Skull Redbird, then Skull Redbird would be destroyed, the monster with the lower defense would be destroyed, but neither player would take battle damage from that encounter. If a monster in attack mode attacks a monster in defense mode that has equal defense to that monster's attack, then neither is destroyed and neither player takes any damage from that. Lastly, if a monster in attack mode attacks a monster in defense mode that has greater defense than that monster's attack, like if this Aquamador attacks this giant soldier of stone, then neither monster would be destroyed in this case but the controller of the attacking monster would take damage equal to the difference between the defending monster's defense and the attacking monster's attack. So for instance, that's 800 here uh, because 2000 minus 1200 is 800.
Now let's go into what happens if a monster attacks a face-down defense position monster. So for instance, if Skull Redbird attacks something like Maneater Bug, uh, because this interaction is actually slightly complicated. It's simple once you know how it works, but before then it's slightly complicated. So if a Skull Redbird attacks a Maneater Bug, that Maneater Bug is flipped face up and then damage is calculated. So it's calculated the Skull Redbird's attack is greater than Maneater Bug's defense, so Maneater Bug will be destroyed by battle. But since Maneater Bug is a flip effect, after that damage calculation, Maneater Bug's effect will be declared and it will be able to destroy a monster on the field. So it will be able to destroy Skull Redbird. And it will, and Skull Redbird will be destroyed. And then, since Maneater Bug had been calculated to be destroyed by battle by that encounter, Maneater Bug will also be destroyed. That's a somewhat, you know, straightforward interaction once you wrap your head around it. Of course, you know, based on the attack and defense rules and damage calculation rules that we just discussed before this, yeah, you know, it makes sense that Maneater Bug will be destroyed, and since Maneater Bug has an effect that activates when it's flipped face up, it makes sense that Skull Redbird would be destroyed as well. But there is some, you know, ambiguity here because it's unclear that if Skull Redbird attacked Maneater Bug and Maneater Bug flipped up, if Maneater Bug would be able to destroy Skull Redbird before uh, any damage calculation went on and Maneater Bug was destroyed. So I just wanted to point out this interaction because uh, Skull Redbird does indeed destroy Maneater Bug, and Maneater Bug's effect happens after it is destroyed by Skull Redbird, but still while it is on the field, which is kind of confusing. Now, after all monsters that want to attack have declared their attacks, then the player can move from the battle step to the end step, which just means that you are declaring that you're going to main phase two. And here effects can be activated. For instance, two-pronged attack or dragon capture jar can be activated at this time if the activation requirements are met. That's the battle phase, which is arguably one of the most complicated parts of Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, so it's good to know these things, but once you get used to it, it will become fairly straightforward. Now we get to one of the most complicated parts of the game's rules, and that's priority and chaining effects. So this doesn't really apply that often in this format, but it can show up in niche cases, and so I want to explain it now to clear up any confusion if you ever play it and this sort of thing comes up. So basically, in each phase, the turn player has the priority to take an action. If they choose not to, then priority passes to the opponent if they have any traps that they can activate. Uh, and the same sort of thing happens when an effect is activated. So let's watch here, uh, and let's assume that it's in the main phase, that this is happening in the main phase. So let's say that the turn player summons a skull redbird, right? And so here, the opponent has a chance to activate an effect. So uh, the turn player asks, you know, do you have a response to the summon of Skull Redbird? Uh, and the other player does. They, they activate Trap Hole in response. And so then priority passes back to the other player in case they have any act effects to activate in response. So, you know, this player asks, do you have a response to my trap hole? Uh, turns out this player does have a response to trap hole, and that's two-pronged attack. And this is a card that, you know, it lets you destroy two of your monsters to destroy one of your opponents. Now, uh, when talking about this, we say that trap hole was chain link one, and that two-pronged attack chained to it and became chain link two. Uh, and if more effects are activated, then those will become chain link three, chain link four, and so on for however many uh, effects you have activated. So 
now this now the turn player asks the other player you know do you have a response to two-pronged attack uh the other player says no and now priority passes back to the turn player to see if they have any effect that they want to activate and so it turns out they do so they're going to chain dragon capture jar to two-pronged attack so dragon capture jar will be chain link three and now they ask you know do their opponent have a response uh let's say the opponent doesn't the opponent doesn't have a response so now the chain is as far as it can go and now we have to actually resolve that chain so what happens is in order to figure out how a chain actually resolves you start at the highest chain link so chain link three in this case and that effect gets resolved first so the effect of dragon capture jar goes into effect and all dragons on the field switch to defense mode chain link three resolved now we move to chain link two two pronged attack resolves destroys skull redbird and cursed dragon and also destroys uh, giant soldier of stone now we go to chain link one which is trap hole trap holes uh the monster it was going to destroy is no longer on the field and so it resolves without effect and now once the chain is completely done all cards that would go to the graveyard do uh, that's an important point is that in the middle of the chain you know Cards that would normally go to the graveyard after resolving don't until the chain until the entire chain is resolved. So that's just a bit of you know a confusing sort of uh, situation that can arise and that uh, will become a lot more important later as you know more chainable cards get introduced into the card pool. But for now, it's more just a niche case that I wanted to cover uh, and. If this confused you, don't worry. The situation will never come up in actual games. Now that we've discussed the basic gameplay rules, let's actually dive into the different strategies that you can use and the different decks that you can play. Because there are a couple different strategies in this format, despite being very, very bare bones. Now, the first direction you can go is a more aggressive strategy, summoning monsters to deplete your opponent's life points down to zero and winning in that way. This is called aggro uh, in terms of card game terminology and will be the majority of decks in the format. Uh, most decks just want to deplete your opponent's life points. It's the simplest way to win and the most straightforward. Now, there is another direction you can go called stall. And the purpose of stall is to prevent your opponent from depleting your life points to zero and to give you enough time to fulfill some alternate win condition. I'll get into those decks later because they're very much their own sort of thing. Uh, but there are many different types of aggro decks to discuss, so I'll spend the majority of this video discussing those. Now, despite the large variety of different aggro decks you can make, there are a certain set of cards that you should probably include in pretty much every one of those. And I call those the core cards of the set. So let's just dive into those core cards and see why they're so good in pretty much every aggro strategy you can do. Uh, and let's start with the monsters. So the monsters fall into sort of different categories based on what role they they fulfill. Uh, the first of these is the four-star beat stick. Now, four-star monsters, you can just summon out without having to pay a cost or tribute a monster or anything like that. And so they're generally going to be the bread and butter of most aggro decks. The best of the four-star beat sticks is Skull Redbird. Skull Redbird has 1550 attack, which is the highest attack on a four-star or lower monster this format, and thus it can beat over any other beat stick in battle. Uh, this makes it very, very good, and a card that you should probably play three copies of no matter what deck you're playing. Uh, similarly, Yurebi is another very high attack beat stick at 1500, the second highest attack on a four, level 4 monster this format. And likewise, it should probably also be at 3, just because it can beat over all beat sticks below it, and it can get in some pretty big damage against your opponent's life points. 
Now we sort of get into the territory of beat sticks that you might not want to run at three or even at all, depending on what sort of aggro deck you're building, but they're still very good to use and good to know about. So these are Witty Phantom and Celtic Guardian. Each of these monsters has 1400 attack, which is the third highest attack in a level four monster in this format. So you might wonder which one of these is actually better to use in most decks. Well, in most decks, Witty Phantom probably edges out Celtic Guardian because its defense points is 1300 as opposed to Celtic Guardian's 12. And so it's slightly better in cases where you have to set it. You know, Witty Phantom might survive an attack that Celtic Guardian would not. Uh, that's, that's a very, very edge case. Probably not likely to come up. So really, you can just use whichever one suits your fancy, probably. Um, I will say, though, that you probably shouldn't be worrying about these too, too much. Probably you only need, like, two, maybe three. Uh, I, I think it's really up to you and how you want to build your aggro deck, how aggressive you want to be with your beat sticks, or whether you want to go a more defensive route. Uh, speaking of defensive routes... We get to the next category of monsters, the four or lower defenders. Now, these are all monsters that are level four or lower uh, that you can bring out with no tribute, no cost, just like the beat sticks. And each of them has 2,000 defense, which is a very hard number for any other monster in the format to get over in terms of attacking it. Uh, so these guys, basically their purpose is to prevent your opponent from attacking in. They can be really good at, you know, stopping your opponent for, in, from inflicting life point damage to you for a turn. And also, some of these can double as sort of an extra attacker. If your opponent's board is clear, you can switch them to attack, attack in, get some chip damage in. It's pretty good. The best of these is Giant Soldier of Stone. Has 1300 attack, the highest attack on a 2000 defense monster. Um... And likewise, Aquamador, second best, 1,200 attack, second highest, defend, second highest attack on a level 4 2,000 defender. And then there's Mystical Elf and Spirit of the Harp following up at the rear, each with 800 attack. If you're choosing between these two in terms of which is probably better if you really, really want, you know, three different defenders in your deck... Uh, Mystical Elf is probably slightly better because there is a field spell in this format that actually gives Spear to the Harp a debuff and decreases its defense. So, you know, in case you wind up in that niche situation, Mystical Elf is slightly better. But really, that, that will likely never come up, so it, it really shouldn't matter. Uh... Now, there is also an argument for preferring Mystical Elf and Spirit of the Harp to Giant Soldier Stone and Aquamador, in that both of these monsters have attack less than 1,000, and thus cannot be destroyed by a card we'll talk about later, Trap Hole. Uh, so if you want to make sure you get in uh, just an extra bit of damage, you can uh, summon a Mystical Elf without fear of it getting Trap Hold, unlike Aquamador and Giant Soldier Stone. Now, this can come up in edge cases, but generally it will be better to have a monster with higher attack, especially because most of the time you're going to set these monsters and they're going to be attacked into by your opponent's monsters, and then you won't even have to worry about getting around Trap Hole because they'll already be face up on the field. Uh, but, you know, if you are worried about that, you can prefer these two. Um, I don't think it will make that much of a difference. Now getting into the actual effect monsters of the set, because all of these monsters are normal, so they're just in here for their baseline attack and defense stats. Now we get into monsters that can bring a little bit more to the table, starting with Maneater Bug. Maneater Bug is probably one of the best monsters in this format, uh, and it's very, very simple in terms of what it does. Basically, you set it face down in the field, and when it's flipped up, it destroys one monster on the field. This can be by battle, so if your opponent summons a monster, attacks into it, you can flip up Man Eater Bug and destroy that monster. 
Um, this can be got by card effect. So if your opponent activates stop defense, it could flip up, destroy a monster in the field. Um, it It's a very simple effect, but it's devastatingly powerful if used correctly. Um, being able to destroy an opponent's powerful monster can be incredibly good. And if it's a surprise, if they expect that they're attacking into a defender, even better. So this card is definitely worth an inclusion in some capacity. Uh, it does have some weaknesses. For instance, it's very susceptible to something like Sword of the Living Light or Stop the Fence while your opponent doesn't have a monster because its effect is mandatory. So if it gets flipped up and it's the only monster in the field, it will destroy itself. But even with those restrictions, it's a very good card, definitely worth including. Uh, probably at three copies, although I can definitely see you opting to go for two uh, if you're worried about the sort of stop defense sword Reeling light interaction. Hain Hain is a card that I have included here, not because it's good, but because it's very similar to Man Eater Bug in terms of what it seems to do. And it is actually a terrible, terrible card that you should not play in your deck. So what Hain Hain does is when it's flipped up, it returns one monster on the field to the opponent, to your hand, to its owner's hand. Um, so this means, you know, you can use it on an opponent's monster that attacks into it, bounce it back to the hand. You can use it on potentially your set monster, your own monsters. So like if you have flipped up a man eater bug and you somehow managed to get a hand hand face down and then flip it face up, you can return the man eater bug to your hand to get it back later so you can use its effect again. Um, also, this card doesn't really suffer from the same weaknesses that Man Eater Bug does in terms of stop defense and Swords of Revealing Light, because if those are activated and it flips up and it's the only monster on the field, it'll just return itself to the hand. So you get it back, you can use it again later. Seems pretty good. However, this card has a major flaw in this format, because this, this format is very much about resource management. Generally, the player who is able to conserve their resources better and have more resources in the end game will likely win the game. Uh, Hand Hain doesn't actually deprive your opponent of any resources like Man Eater Bug does. It just sets them back a turn. Uh, so it can be good in affecting the tempo of the game, you know, which side feels like it has more momentum. But in the later stages of the game, Ultimately, it, it doesn't do anything, and it will actually help out your opponent in the end game if you have used a Hain Hain earlier, because they'll just have one more resource to use against you. So, in my opinion, it's a very bad card, even though it does seem very tempting. It seems very good. Uh, it's just bad, though. Avoid this card, uh, I would say. Uh, or don't. You could use it. Uh, just don't blame me when you lose games with it. The last flip monster I want to talk about is probably my favorite card in the set because it is basically the opposite of Hain Hain, where Hain Hain on first read sounds really good, but in actuality is really bad. Arm Ninja sounds really bad, but in actuality is pretty damn good. So what Arm Ninja does is when it's flipped up, you target one spell card on the field and destroy that target. Uh, now. This has obvious applications in destroying things like equip spells, field spells, and swords revealing light, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but beyond that, you might think, oh, what's the point of this card, right? And you might relegate it to sort of like, oh, maybe I'll include it in the side deck as a niche counter to those sorts of strategies. Well, I'm here to tell you that this card actually takes names in the main deck uh, and should be included in the main deck. Uh, because a big, big part of this format is bluffing. There's only one trap card in the game that's actually worth playing, and that's Trap Hole. But if each player only set a spell or trap card face down when they had Trap Hole, then their opponent would always know when they had Trap Hole or not, and so could play around it. Uh, so it makes sense to maybe set a spell card that's a bit weaker, or just if you have all powerful spells, just set a powerful spell thinking, oh, I'll activate it later. Um, in order to make your opponent think that you have a trap hole 
and then force them to play around it, maybe make them make a subpar move that they wouldn't have done if you didn't have that card set. Arm Ninja really punishes those bluffs because if you have a set Arm Ninja and your opponent sets a powerful spell as a bluff, you can flip up that Arm Ninja, potentially snipe that powerful spell, deprive them of an immensely powerful resource that they wanted to use later. So it's incredibly good for that reason. A very skillful card, a very skill testy card where you have to you have to really know the ins and outs of the format to really utilize this to the to its maximum extent, but it's still very good. And also, Sword of the Willing Light is just an incredibly powerful card, and Arm Ninja is the only card in the format that can actually remove it uh, before it destroys itself. And you know, even if there wasn't much bluffing going on in the game, I'd say it's still worth an inclusion in the main deck at at least one copy. Uh, just to get rid of these pesky swords, because they can really, really slow down a game and uh, and really screw you over. So yeah, that's all the main powerful monsters uh, that I would say just should go in pretty much every aggro deck. Whenever you're building an aggro deck, you should probably use some combination of these monsters as the core, and then build out your other monsters from there. Um, but... Monsters are actually one of the weaker parts of this format. The real bread and butter card of this set, though, are the spell cards, which are, they just blow the monsters out of the water. These spells are the cards that are really going to determine how the game goes and who the winner is. Um, they're just, they should be, basically, you should have just three copies of pretty much all of them in any deck that you build. Uh... So let's just, let's get into why they're so powerful uh, and why they sort of are this sort of format defining cards. So firstly, we have Pot of Greed. Now, this is the most powerful card in the set, bar none. And at first you might wonder why that is. It seems sort of underwhelming. All it does is it draws you two cards. So why is it so powerful compared to something like you know, Raigeki, Dark Hole, Monster Reborn cards that can really swing the course of the game uh, and deprive your opponent of a lot of resources or give you a lot of resources. Well, Pot of Greed gives you a lot of resources too. Basically, it's just free cards, right? It's one card that counts as two cards. So a Raigeki can count as... or um, A Pot of Greed can count as both like a Raigeki and a Skull Redbird, if that's what you draw. It can count as an Arm Ninja and a Witty Phantom, which, you know, isn't necessarily the best, but you've got those cards in your hand now. You're not drawing them for the next two turns. Pot of is just free cards. It's, it's incredibly good. Gives you one more resource uh, than your opponent if you have a Pot of Greed and they don't. And as I said, resources are everything in this format. So... I think Pot of Greed is the best card in the format. But, you know, that's not to say the other spells aren't powerful. And Raigeki is a perfect example of that. Raigeki, a very simple effect, just destroys all monsters your opponent controls. This can be incredibly, incredibly good. You know, if your opponent has two or three monsters, Raigeki is one resource that trades for two or three. Uh incredibly good should be at three in every deck and is a card that you know you don't want to necessarily use right away you want to save to be used at the most optimal moments to use it and it may seem very simple but it's actually very skillful on when you actually should play this or not likewise dark hole is like a slightly less powerful version of raigeki Dark Hole is also very simple, destroys all monsters on the field. So, you know, if you have a monster and your opponent has three, if you play a Dark Hole, you're going to lose your monster. Whereas if you played a Raigeki, you wouldn't. So that might seem less good, but Dark Hole in most cases is just functionally Raigeki. Because since both players have so much access to removal in terms of Raigeki and Dark Hole, your field is going to be empty of monsters a lot of the time. So 
often when you activate Dark Hole, it's basically just going to be Raigeki because you're not going to have any monsters on the field for it to destroy. So, very good card. Basically just a second copy of Raigeki. Um, or I guess a fourth, fifth, and sixth copy of Raigeki. Um, because you should be playing both of these cards at three. Now, Fisher is sort of the weakest of these destruction spell cards. Uh, what Fisher does is destroys the one face-up monster that your opponent controls that has the lowest attack. And so that might not seem very good compared to something like Dark Hole or Raigeki because, you know, it's got so many restrictions. It only destroys one monster. Seems pretty bad, right? Well, Fisher sort of serves a role uh, in destroying monsters that you wouldn't necessarily want to destroy with a Dark Hole and Raigeki. Let's say your opponent has one Skull Redbird on the field, right? And you don't want them to have that Skull Redbird because you've got other beaters in your hand that can't get over it. Well, you don't necessarily want to waste a Dark Hole or Raigeki getting rid of one resource, right? That's not the best trade you can make with those cards. But Fisher can just clear it out of the way. It's a one card for one card, one resource for one resource. But used well, you can get rid of a very powerful resource. Uh, and then bring out your beater and attack, get in. You know, it it's pretty good. Uh, it's a card that definitely grows on you, you know. It starts out and you're like, man, why am I playing this card when I could be playing Dark Hole or Raigeki? But then you play it for long enough and you're like, okay, yeah, this this is very, very good. Um, not at Dark Hole and Raigeki levels, but definitely worth including a lot of in the deck. Uh, probably three copies, although you can also drop down lower and exchange it for something like Stop Defense, which we'll get to later. But very good card. Don't don't underestimate it given uh, given its comparison to Dark Hole and Raigeki because it's just incredibly good. The next card we get to is something completely different from a Destruction and a Draw card. Uh, it's Monster Reborn. And this is a very, very good card in this format. Not necessarily because of what it does, but what it plays around. So, Monster Reborn lets you target one monster in either player's graveyard and special summon it to your side of the field. So, let's say that your opponent has a Skull Redbird in your graveyard. Uh, you can bring back that Skull Redbird and attack with it. You know, get over a beater, deal some damage. Pretty good, right? Uh, now, it may only get you one additional monster on the field, but what makes it so powerful is it special summons that monster. Any other summon in the game that's not a special summon is susceptible to Trap Hole, which we'll get to later, but is a very, very useful tool in disrupting your opponent's plays and can really, you know, be the difference between winning the game one turn or, you know, not winning it. And Monster Reborn is basically the only card that gets around it. So Monster Reborn can be very, very useful just to win out of nowhere at the end of the game. If your opponent has a trap hole set that they've been saving up and they expect you to not be able to win through that trap hole, uh, if you saved up your Monster Reborns throughout the course of the game, you can play two or three of them potentially in one turn and bring out three Skull Redbirds. And that right there is 4650 damage, which is over half of 8,000. So it can really enable you to just win out of seemingly nowhere if you use it correctly. Uh, so it's very, very useful. Uh, very good card. You should definitely include three of it in your deck as well. Sword of the Light is one of the most annoying cards in this format, I'd say. Uh, basically what it does is you activate it, stays on the field for three turns, three of your opponent's turns even, which is even better. Uh, and your opponent can't attack during that time. Uh, this is incredibly good at just stopping your opponent's offensive, letting you accrue more resources because you get to draw each of those turns. So basically you're getting three free draws with Sword of the Light and you can still attack while it's on your side of the field. It only prevents your opponent from attacking. So you can sort of get on the offensive with it uh, if you want to. So it's it's incredibly good. And that's not even getting into the fact that it has an additional effect 
where it flips all of your opponent's face down monsters face up. So this can be good at if your opponent has one set monster and it's a man in your bug, playing Swords of Revealing Light destroys that man in your bug, essentially, which is incredibly good. Let's say you have a Fisher in hand and your opponent has a set monster that you think is a defender. Play Swords of Revealing Light. Play Fisher. You know, there you go. Uh, it, it just takes out that problem. So it's an incredibly, incredibly good card for a has a lot of different uh, applications and it's it's arguably even better than uh, something like Raigeki or Dark Hole even just in terms of how many resources it lets you get for free uh, but that's very debatable either way it's a great card you should probably include three of it in your deck I would say last spell card is easily the least powerful but it's still incredibly good and that's stop defense. And what stop defense does is it just changes one defense monster to attack position. Uh, now this can be useful at you know switching the defenders to attack, so you can beat over them with your beat sticks. Also, when it affects a face down monster, like a man eater bug that's set face down, it will flip it into attack face up attack mode, uh, which will then trigger its effect and. Uh, destroy itself in the case of man your bug so it can be very good for doing that uh it can also you know like swords it can make things vulnerable to fisher potentially it's it's a pretty good card uh the one reason why i'd say you know it's less underwhelming than the others is because when you're playing defensively and your opponent's you know mounting a big offensive it doesn't really help you in that it only helps when you're going on the offensive. And even then, you know, it doesn't necessarily help as much as like a Dark Hole or Raigeki or even a Fisher in a lot of cases. So it's kind of underwhelming. I do think that you should probably include maybe like one or two copies if you have the space for it. Um, and it, it's definitely worth like considering that your opponent's playing as well and sort of keeping in mind that this is a card. That is useful, but it's easily the worst of the spells, and uh, yeah, it's it's just it can't compete with the other ones, but still very good. Lastly, now that we've covered the monsters and spells, there's only one card type left to to talk about, and that is traps. Now, there's only one playable trap in this format, and that's trap hole. Uh, the other traps. I mean, there are only two other traps, and some of them have niche applications. I'll discuss them later. But really, you know, they're, they're just not very good to include in the main deck. Uh, trap Hole, on the other hand, can be very, very good and can really throw a wrench in your opponent's plans if they don't play around it well. What it does is your, if your opponent normal or flip summons a monster with a thousand or more attack, you get to destroy that monster. And... This is pretty good. Let's say you have like a Eurabi on the field. Your opponent summons a Skull Redbird. You can just trap hole it, protect your Eurabi. You know, your opponent's lost a resource. The real, you know, power of this card though is that it's basically the only card that can interact with your opponent during your opponent's turn. So, and that's especially, especially useful given the insane things that your opponent can do to you during their turn. So this can be a very good safeguard against, you know, let's say your opponent activates Raigeki and then they're, they're all excited to deal some damage to you, some major damage to you, and they summon a Skull Redbird. You can trap hole that, protect yourself from that damage. Um, it's very good. And, you know, even if you're not actually using it, like on the turn that you have it set, Having it there, like I mentioned earlier with the power of bluffs, having it there can make your opponent make subpar plays potentially just because they're trying to play around it and not lose a monster. So it's incredibly, incredibly good. Uh, and you should definitely include it at three. But those are the cards that I think everyone should include in, in the decks of this format if it's an aggro deck. Uh, I don't necessarily think you should include all of these at three, but... They're, they're all very, very good. They're very, very generically good. And so, yeah. 
I think they should all be included. Now let's get into the sort of more niche strategies, the different directions you can go with your specific aggro builds. And uh, many of those I think are not very good, a bit jank, but I'll discuss all of them. Uh, first, let's discuss what I think is the best aggro deck in the format though. Before discussing all the different sorts of aggro strategies you can do in this format, I want to discuss what I think is the best aggro strategy. The aggro strategy that basically curb stomps any other aggro strategy it goes up against. And that is this deck right here. Now you can see it's pretty much just made up entirely of the core cards that I mentioned before. And for good reason. These core cards are incredibly powerful, incredibly, incredibly good. And so you should really just be stuffing as many as you can in the deck. So every card in this deck is able to get you an advantage in some way. The beat sticks are able to attack in, destroy your opponent's monsters, deal damage potentially. The defenders are able to stall for a turn or two. Uh, preventing your opponent's aggro cards from getting over them. Man your bugs can get rid of your opponent's monsters. Arm Ninja can get rid of your opponent's spells, and especially Sword of Revealing Light. Uh, Dark Hole, Raigeki, Fisher, all those cards can destroy your opponent's monsters very proactively. Uh, Pot of Greed can get you more cards. Sword of Revealing Light can stall a game a bit when you need to go a bit more defensive. Stop Defense can deal with your opponent's defensive plays, and of course three trap holes can disrupt your opponent's turn. These, these cards are just incredibly good, and substituting them for anything else is just sort of a step down. Now, I think you could debate some of my ratios here, like maybe six defenders is a bit too much, maybe I should swap out an Aquamador for another Witty Phantom, uh, maybe I should just have one arm ninja. Maybe I should have three. Maybe I should cut down man your bug to two. You know, you can debate this sort of thing endlessly. Uh, I will just say that, you know, even if the ratios aren't perfect, I think this deck is extremely, extremely good. Uh, I think it can beat a lot of the more gimmicky aggro decks that I'll talk about soon. Uh, and that's just because it sticks to the basics, sticks to just the best cards in the format. As a note, the side deck here is tailored specifically, except for the dragon capture jars, it's tailored explicitly to stop stall decks. Uh, specifically one stall deck, which I'll cover later. But a lot of stall decks don't, uh, against a lot of stall decks, things like Sword of Revealing Light and Trap Hole are a lot less good. Uh, and even like Manier Bug is a lot less good against a lot of stall decks because they just won't attack into it or they'll destroy it before it can get its effect. So uh, it's very good to swap in a lot of these cards that can let you go more aggro. These 1300 attack monsters are the next highest attack on a level 4 lower monster in the game. And they can be really good if your opponent is solely playing defensive, if your opponent's not playing the beat sticks that would be able to get over them, especially in you know baiting your opponent's trap holes, because your opponent's not going to want to waste a trap hole in something like a trial of nightmare when they could take down a skull redbird or your rabi, but you might force them to. Uh, so these cards can really, really be useful against a stall matchup. Uh, the arm ninja also is great to bring in a stall matchup, get rid of sword of Revealing light. Uh, so. With these, with these cards, you know, this deck can pretty much beat any stall deck uh, pretty easily. And the dragon capture jars, you know, I'm going to talk about the dragon deck soon. There is a deck that you can make with dragons, uh, sort of bringing out these powerful dragons that beat over everything else in the format. So you can bring these in for that. The dragon deck isn't very good. Um, so these, these are kind of just here as a joke, but yeah, they could come up, so why not? Uh, you could also just substitute them for just better cards, like, substitute them for some defenders, maybe, 
Uh, you could substitute them for maybe more beaters against the stall matchup. Who's to say? These are probably unnecessary, but they are very funny. Now that we've discussed the best aggro deck in the format, let's discuss the myriad other decks that try and do aggro just a bit better. And let's discuss why they're frankly just not as good as the, the one that I just showed you. The first sort of improvement on that aggro deck you can try to make is by playing tribute monsters. Tribute monsters generally have a higher attack and a higher defense than any of the, you know, four-star beat sticks or four-star defenders. So you might think, well, why not just use these? Because, you know, Blue Eyes White Dragon, which is, has the highest attack of a monster in the game so far, that can easily get over something like a Giant Soldier of Stone or an Aquamador that something like a Skull Redbird couldn't. Well, the issue with playing something like Blue Eyes is that in order to bring it out, you have to sacrifice two cards. And Blue Eyes is very easy to stop with something like a Trap Hole or any sort of removal spell, like a Raigeki, a Dark Hole, even a Fisher if you don't have any mo other monsters on the board. So while very good, it's very easy to get rid of for your opponent given the high amount of removal in the game. And so even if you're able to get in like one attack with this monster at 3000, which it's pretty good, you know, most likely you're not going to have the chance to do that because there will be a defender or there'll be, you know, a trap hole waiting for you. It, it's just, you're not really going to get much value out of it probably. And if you're sacrificing, you know, for instance, like a Skull Redbird and your Raby to summon this out, well, a Eurabi and a Skull Redbird, their total attack combined is 3,050. So if you're just trying to deal base damage, it's actually better to keep them both on the field instead of going into a Blue Eyes. And again, like, while this can get over sort of other skull redbirds or defenders, you also have so much removal that you can just use instead. So you could use one card to remove a threat instead of using essentially three, the two tributes and the monster. So frankly, it's just not that good, especially because as I've said before, this format is so, so defined by how resources are handled and how you manage your resources. And just having a card that spends three resources to at best like remove one of your opponent's resources, it's just not very good. So you might be wondering, well, that's a two tribute monster. What about a one tribute monster? Well, the highest attack on a one tribute monster is on Curse of Dragon, which has 2000 attack. The issue with this is, is that this cannot get over something like a giant soldier of stone uh, or any of the other 2k defenders. It can defeat a Skull Redbird, so it, it can actually, you know, be sort of the better beat stick in a way when you have it on the field. But again, you're, you're sacrificing a monster to summon this out, and there's so much removal in this format that it's not likely to survive the next turn. And even if it does stick the landing and doesn't face a trap hole. If it attacks into something like a giant soldier of stone, then, you know, it might not accomplish anything. And instead of summoning out this monster, you could have summoned another monster and used like a fisher or something to get rid of, or, or anything to get rid of your opponent's monsters that this would get over. Um, and you could potentially get in for more damage that way because a Skull Redbird plus even something like an Aquamador deals way more damage than a Curse of Dragon on its own. And since that's the best of the one tribute monsters, the others aren't really worth it. So I mentioned earlier about fusion monsters, and I said I'd discuss them later. Well, later is now. So what a fusion monster is, is it's a monster that stays in your extra deck outside of your main deck that lists two monsters uh, in its description. 
And those monsters are its fusion material monsters. So the way that you can bring this out is by using the spell card Polymerization and sending those monsters that are listed on the fusion monster to the graveyard from your hand or field, and then you can special summon out that fusion monster. So you might think, oh, that's great. It can actually get around Trap Hole, which is true because it's a special summon. So if you special summon out something like Gaia the Dragon Champion, then your opponent can't trap hole it, which is very good. It can be a lot of damage out of nowhere. And something like Gaia the Dragon Champion specifically can get over a giant soldier of stone. So that might seem pretty appealing. The only issue is, is that you really need to get lucky in drawing both polymerization and the fusion materials to actually summon this fusion monster. And with Gaia the Dragon Champion specifically, the two fusion materials needed for polymerization are both tribute monsters, which we've already discussed aren't really good on their own. So while you're waiting to amass the combo to get you into Gaia the Dragon Champion, these cards are just kind of dead cards in your hand that you can't use. And in a game that's really dependent on how many resources each player has at a given time that they can actually use to further their game state and further their strategy, uh, this, this is just, it takes too much. It takes too many cards to make work. Um, well, you might be wondering, well, what about the other fusion monsters? Surely I don't have to play Guy the Dragon Champion. Maybe the other fusion monsters have better fusion materials that can make them, you know, a bit better to play in a deck. Well, the first issue is that Guy the Dragon Champion has the most attack on a fusion monster, and the next highest attack on a fusion monster is Metal Dragon with 1850. Then comes Flame Swordsman and Flower Wolf tied to 1800, and it's just downhill from there. These monsters can't even get over a giant soldier of stone. You know, they can get over a Skull Redbird, but you could just use a Fisher to do that instead. You're spending three cards to bring out one card that will likely die to removal on the next turn and can't even get over a Defender. So it's not really worth it. In addition, some of their fusion materials are, are just bad. You know, like Steel Ogre Grotto number one, which you use to make Metal Dragon, is actually another tribute monster. Except unlike Curse of Dragon, it can't even get over a Skull Redbird. Uh, similarly, all the other fusion materials are just kind of very, very weak. You know, they're, they're not going to be able to get over any of the beaters. You can set them to sort of fend off an attack, but they're not going to survive any attacks that hit into them because they've got such low defense points as well. So, you know, you can play a fusion deck. You can play polymerization um, and these fusion monsters, but... It's just you're playing, you're committing to playing a bunch of bad cards in your main deck. And you, like, if you draw very, very well, you could have a pretty good turn bringing out a big fusion monster. But then that monster will likely easily be taken care of. And then you've lost so many cards. And you've really got to get another lucky turn eventually to be able to pull off something similar. And it's just not worth it. So we've covered fusion, we've covered tributes. The next big sort of way that you can try and exceed the bare bones aggro strategy I put forward is through a tribal strategy. Now a tribal strategy refers to using cards of a similar type or attribute that get a buff from something like a field spell or an equip spell and using those cards to get an edge over your opponent in battle. So let's focus on the field spells first uh, to sort of explain why tribal strategies don't generally work out well, or at least aren't the optimal strategy in this format. So if you use something like a mountain, mountain will increase the attack and defense of all dragon, wing beasts, and thunder monsters on the field. So this will boost your skull redbird. So you might think that's pretty good. The only issue is, it's not boosting your Skull Redbird over your opponent's Skull Redbirds because their Skull Redbirds also get boosted by Mountain. And 
so you're not really gaining any benefit from playing the mountain. The skill Redbird can't even hit over a 2k defender like Giant Soldier of Stone. Uh, and the other winged beast and dragon monsters at a level 4 or lower that could potentially pair up well with Mountain as well, none of them really cut the mustard. You know, Tyhone and Fiend Reflection number 2 can both get their defense up to 1600, which would be able to block something like a Urabi. But since Skull Redbird's getting boosted as well, it can still hit over those because it will have 1750 attack. So you can't even use the mountain strategy sort of to mount a good defense because your opponent's Skull Redbirds will just be able to hit through them. Now, you might notice that with mountain specifically, if you pair a mountain with a Curse of Dragon, that can be pretty good because your Curse of Dragon will have 2200 attack and thus be able to get over something like a Giant Soldier of Stone. While this is true, you're still using essentially three cards to get over one Giant Soldier of Stone. You're using the monster you tributed to summon out Curse of Dragon, you're using Mountain, and you're using Curse of Dragon itself. A card that is easily removed by all sorts of removal, like Fisher, Dark Hole, Raigeki, all those good stuff. It's slightly better than using three cards for a Blue Eyes, right? But it's still kind of subpar when you could just be using a removal spell instead of the Mountain. The other field spells offer very similar sorts of issues. Wasteland can boost up your Raby, but since both players are likely playing your Raby, again, it will be sort of a moot point, as the Rabies will be able to will be able to hit over a Skull Redbird, but will just crash with each other. So it's basically just changing the hierarchy of four-star beaters in not really a meaningful way. It will also boost up the defense of Giant Soldier of Stone. But again, that's not really a worry because nothing really beats over Giant Soldier of Stone in terms of attacking over it. So it's not really worth the boost there. Now, Yami is a bit of an interesting field spell because that boosts Fiend and Spellcaster type monsters, uh, which is, you know, Witty Phantom is a, fiend, is a Fiend monster and Aquamador and Mystical Elf as well are both Spellcasters, so they get a boost. But again, you're just sort of shifting the hierarchy a bit, where Witty Phantom will be able to get over Skull Redbird and Urabi, but everyone's likely on Witty Phantom anyways, so you're not really getting much benefit from it. Something interesting to note is that Trial of Nightmare, which is a 1300 attack monster, will be able to tie with a Urabi and thus become a 1500 attack monster, which is, you know, pretty decent. But at if you play Trial of Nightmare in hopes of, you know, getting essentially more Urabies in your deck, then whenever you don't have Yami, that Trial of Nightmare is really, really useless. Uh, it dies to pretty much everything. So it's not really worth going down this path, uh, even though it can occasionally get you essentially more copies of Urabi. It's not really worth it. The last interesting field spell that I'm going to talk about is Sogan. And Sogan's interesting because, just like Yami, it can boost up the attack and defense of another 1400 beater, which is Celtic Guardian. Uh, the reason I think Sogan is actually slightly better than Yami is because I think that Wii Phantom is generally the better card that people are going to be including in their generic aggro decks. So, it's more likely that your opponent will have a Witty Phantom than a Celtic Guardian. This means that if you're playing Sogan, it could potentially be essentially a one-sided boost, as opposed to the other field spells, which basically affect both players the same way. So, you could play a copy of Sogan, max out on Celtic Guardians, and be reasonably assured that your opponent won't be able to uh, have Celtic Guardians of their own to benefit from it. Uh, that can be pretty decent, but if this strategy ever actually gets good, then people can just switch over from using Witty Phantoms to using Celtic Guardians. And then at that point, Yami will be the better strategy, and it will be sort of a seesawing effect back and forth. Luckily, this strategy is not the best strategy. It can be pretty decent, 
But, you know, Armed Ninja is a card that a lot of decks are playing, and that can deal with the Sogan pretty well. Uh, in addition, you know, basic removal spells like Fisher can deal with Celtic Guardian as well under Sogan. But it is not the worst strategy. In addition, Beaver Warrior can become a sizable defender under the strategy and attacker with 1400 attack. But, you know, why play Beaver Warrior when you could just play a Giant Soldier of Stone? So that way you can have a good defense when Sogan isn't on the field. There are two other field spells, Umi and Forest, which, you know, also boost certain types of monsters. But there are no good monsters to pair with them, so I'm not actually going to discuss them. You can look into it on your own, but they're just very, very bad. Like, no deck can really benefit from them well. Now that we've discussed the field spells, let's get into the other type of tribal boost, which is equip spells. Equip spells have a pretty nice benefit over field spells in that they're largely one-sided. So you can equip, for instance, a follow in to your Skull Redbird and actually use your Skull Redbird to get over your opponent's Skull Redbird, which is very nice. Uh, the issue is, is that if you have it in your hand and you don't have monsters of the given type to equip to, it's basically a dead card until you draw a monster of that given type. And given how Skull Redbird is the best 4-star beater in the game, if you summon out a Skull Redbird, your opponent might just trap hole it, meaning that your Follow Wind won't get any use. Now, thinking of this, you could try and take a different tack and try and go for something like a raised body heat instead and equip it onto Yurabi because Yurabi is less likely to get trap hold than Skull Redbird is. Uh, the issue here is that again, you know, if you don't have your rabies in hand, raised body heat is kind of useless. Although it does let your rabies get over Skull Redbird. Another issue is, is that this isn't really any better usually than just using something like a Fisher on the Skull Redbird instead of a raised body heat. Sure, you could potentially get advantage over time if your Yurabi equipped with raised body heat survives more than one turn. But most likely it's not going to, or even if it does, it can't get over a 2k defender, and thus it won't be able to keep getting advantage because your opponent might just set a 2k defender. So the equip strategy generally isn't as good. There's one more equip, mo equip spell that I'll talk about, which is Dark Energy, which increases the attack of fiends. And, you know, like I mentioned before with Yami, there are multiple fiends that can get over Skull Redbird with a Dark Energy. Witty Phantom and Trial of Nightmare can both get over it, so it could make an equipped spell card a bit less of a brick if you have more monsters in your deck that it can go with. However, in order to justify this, you have to actually be playing these monsters. And playing Trial of Nightmare is generally pretty bad if you don't have the equipped spell or field spell in hand. So they're just not too, too good. Something else to note before I move off the topic of equip spells is that you can equip multiple equip spells to a monster, and that could potentially get something like a Rabi up over a 2k defender if you equip two raised body heats with it. However, just like with the blue eyes, you've just spent three resources to get rid of one of your opponents, and your opponent could always just use something like a Fisher or a Raigeki or even a Dark Hole to get rid of the monster you've just boosted up. So it's not really that good. Uh, I think equip spells are the better version of the tribal strategy in most cases. Like obviously with warriors and stuff, Sogan is better because you get the you get basically the one-sided effect on Celtic Guardian uh, if you if your opponent isn't also playing Celtic Guardian. But Overall, these tribal strategies are just a lot less resource efficient than the bare bones aggro strategy. And they also just like, they brick too much. If you don't have, if you don't have the right monsters in hand to utilize them correctly, then, you know, you're, you're losing the resource war a lot quicker than you would be otherwise. Now, I want to bring up a new type of sort of way to sort of get in more damage there than just using monsters. 
And that's actually using spell cards that inflict damage to your opponent. Things like Final Flame, Hinotama, and Sparks all have an effect that just inflicts damage to your opponent directly. You don't need a monster at all. The issue is that these are the only three cards in the set that do this, and if you add up the damage dealt by three copies of each of these, like let's say if you played three Final Flame in one duel, three Hinotama, and three Sparks, you would get a grand total of 3,900, which is less than half of your opponent's life points. You could probably get more damage in just by using a monster and a removal spell to attack directly. Like, these cards just don't do enough for you to actually make it worth including them. 600 is just very, very pathetic when compared to the damage that you can do with any other card in the game. And the other two cards are just worse than that. Even if you're sort of setting up a stall burn strategy where you you know, play Swords Revealing Light and a bunch of defenders and just use these, they're not going to be able to close out the game. So they're just not worth using. Conversely, there are also cards in the set that actually increase your life points. So for instance, Goblin Secret Remedy and Red Medicine increase your life points by 600 and 500 respectively. You might think that these are decent ways to, you know, buy yourself more time, but realistically, they're not going to protect your life points more than a removal spell would, or a defender would even. 600 is less than half of a Skull Redbird or any of the other beaters that decks most often run. And so, you know, this may potentially buy you one turn if you get very lucky, but the, the amount that you gain from it can easily be taken away very, very quickly. And so it's just, they, they don't do enough. They're not really worth it. Even in stall decks, I'd say they're not worth it. But we'll get to stall decks later. The last sort of innovative thing you can really do in this format that I can think of, uh, and if you ever do think of more, please let me know in the comments. I'd be very curious to see what you all come up with, is playing monsters that actually get under trap hole. I discussed this a little when I was discussing the defenders in the core card section of the video and saying that, you know, you could use Mystical Elf or Spirit of the Harp to actually get under trap hole. And that might be a reason why you'd play it over something like a Giant Soldier of Stone or Alcomador. And there are two monsters in this format with 900 attack just below the threshold for Trap Hole. However, in playing around Trap Hole, you're just playing a terrible monster that dies to everything else. Honestly, if your opponent could hit these with Trap Hole, they probably wouldn't even bother because they could just summon a monster next turn and beat over them. So it's not really worth considering these in the main deck, even though it is kind of funny that they get around Trap Hole. They're just kind of bad cards. So that's, to the best of my knowledge, all the, the separate sort of aggro strategies you can do in this format. Uh, and that's also why they're largely just inferior to the bare bones aggro strat. I think the, I think the probably best options if you are doing one of these is to potentially do something like the Sogan Celtic Guardian deck because Sogan will stay on the field for a while. And if your opponent has to use an Arm Ninja on it, that's a pretty decent trade. Uh, and you're likely playing a 1400 beater anyways, but Again, it's just not that good. The equip strategies also have some merit, uh, potentially, depending on how the game goes. But again, they're just not very good. But those are probably the best sort of strategies that you can glean from this. Um, but I, you know, if you want to play these, you can play these. I'm not going to say you can't. And you could potentially even win a game or two with them. It's just you're a lot less likely to than the bare bones aggro deck. Now that we've discussed all the aggro, let's get into uh, the stall decks because those are quite, quite different. And unlike aggro, there's only really a couple ways you can go with them. Now, I think this is the best stall strategy in the game. But before I get into more detail why, I will give an honorable mention to the other stall strategy in the game, which is deck out. 
Now, as I mentioned before, one of the ways to win the game is if your opponent runs out of cards and can't draw anymore when they need to. This condition is called deck out, and you feasibly could try and make a deck just of all defenders, like max out on Sword Revealing Light, max out on Trap Holes, max out on Removal, and you could just try to prevent your opponent from being able to attack you, and then wait until they draw through their entire deck, and then win that way. The issue with that strategy is that there's just too much removal. There's too many ways to clear the board and attack in that you're not going to be able to make them go through 40 cards before they're able to kill you in pretty much all cases. But I want to mention that there, um, just in case anyone wants to try to build it, you can. It's just very, very much not good. And why would you when you have this deck, this monstrosity, that can actually win games against aggro? Um, now, you might be looking at this and wondering, what the heck is this? This is a lot of cards I haven't seen. None of these cards have been mentioned before, except for like the core cards that are in here. What What is the point of this deck? Well, I mentioned earlier that you know, there are some alternate win conditions in the game, but there's only one in this format. That one alternate win condition is Exodia. Exodia the Forbidden One is a Fect monster that just automatically causes you to win the game if you have it, Left Arm of the Forbidden One, Right Arm of the Forbidden One, Left Leg of the Forbidden One, and Right Leg of the Forbidden One in your hand at the same time. All these cards, you can play at three copies in your deck, and because you can, you're pr you're pretty likely, it's not 100% guaranteed, but you're decently likely to draw into five of them, at least, uh, in the first 20 or so cards of your deck. Uh, that's not a guarantee. You know, you can get really unlucky and say, like, let's see, a, all three heads are on the bottom of your deck, and then you're probably just going to lose. But it's a much shorter clock than the deck out stall deck has, and it also has a lot of other benefits as well. So one of the biggest issues that you may see with this deck is that since we're playing three copies of each piece, we could potentially get duplicates in our hand. Like, what do we do if we draw two heads? That seems kind of bad, right? Especially since resources are so valuable in this format. Well, the good thing is, is that these cards are all monsters. So, if you have a copy in them, that if you have a copy of them in your hand that's a duplicate, you can always just set them and sort of just block an attack with that. Sure, they're no 2k defender. They can't, you know, prevent your opponent from being able to hit over them and then attack with another monster. But they can stop one attack at a time, and that's often good enough. In addition, Sword of Revealing Light is an incredibly hard card to remove in this format. Yes, there is Arm Ninja that can get rid of this card. But if you play around Arm Ninja correctly, you can preserve your Sword of Revealing Light using things like Dark Hole or Raigeki, and potentially just, you know, keep the swords active for as long as possible. Pot of Greeds also help you dig deeper into the deck. And pretty much everything else is just a removal spell. Like, we could play Monster Reborn in this deck to revive a defender. But honestly, we just want to max out on getting rid of our opponent's resources to deal damage to us. Because eventually they'll probably run out. Now, this deck does lose to the aggro deck after the, the aggro deck sides in a bunch of smaller beaters as well and removes things like Trap Hole and Swords of the Light. And for that reason, this deck isn't necessarily the best deck in the format, right? It can, it can win game one a lot of the time, uh, especially if your opponent isn't expecting that. But, I mean, games two and three are tough. Like, there's no real good thing to side in here. Like, Dragon Capture Jar, of course, for the Dragon deck, if someone's playing that. You could potentially side in a two-pronged attack to counter against Raigekis. 
and use up duplicate Exodia pieces, but they're not very good. You can use Gravedigger's Ghoul, which is a card I'll talk about later, uh, to get rid of monsters in your opponent's graveyard that they might monster reborn, but that also just isn't very good at all. Uh, and of course, you can just add more defenders if you want, like Mystical Elves are pretty good to defend against. Especially if your opponent's playing a Yami deck, you can swap these in for the Giant Soldier of Stones. They'll gain more defense. But, you know, this deck, there's no real good siding option. And that really does hamper it. Because this deck just does hard lose when the opponent just can keep bringing out a monster each turn. Even if it's not the most powerful monster in the world. If they can just keep bringing out a monster every single turn and hammering in with those monsters. It can overwhelm you before you draw all five pieces you need. So, I mean... It is what it is, but like, you know, it is kind of a degenerate strategy. So it's probably good that there's no real effective way to side for it and make this deck viable beyond a game one win. Okay, yeah, I lied. Um, there is actually a way to make this deck win games two and three. And it is very, very funny. Uh, it also is one of the reasons why this format is not necessarily the best because it kind of relies on things outside of the actual games themselves. So what you can do is if you're on this Exodia deck and you expect that your opponent is going to side in to all those smaller monsters and side out their Sword of Villain Light and trap holes and all of that, then you can just smokescreen directly into an aggro build yourself. There are exactly 15 Exodia pieces in this deck, and there are exactly 15 cards in the side deck. So you could just side out all of those Exodia pieces, side in the beat sticks that you aren't playing, side in monster reborns, side in a stop defense, and just curb stomp your opponent for playing a weaker aggro deck since they've taken out a lot of the tools that can really stop opposing aggro decks. Now, this isn't foolproof. If your opponent chooses not to side into that inferior aggro deck, then you're basically playing an aggro mirror match. But if you are playing an aggro mirror match, you know, it's a lot more of a game there. There's a lot higher of a chance that you're going to win that than if you had just stayed with the original Exodia deck that you played game one. Now, this may sound kind of fun, is sort of like, ooh, we can mind game each other in the sideboarding process, but it can lead to just some bad games, right? Like, if, if your opponent has to decide for game two whether to, you know, keep their deck the same and potentially just lose to you keeping your Exodia deck the same, or completely remodel your de their deck, and lose to you just completely transforming your deck into aggro and having an uneven aggro matchup, it's it's not the it's not the best feeling uh, to lose that way, I'll say. Uh, so I do think that this is likely the best deck in the format. Um, just because game one, you've got a pretty good chance of winning. Uh, Game two and three, you can play these sorts of mind games with your opponent. And if you play them well, you can just, you know, curb stomp them pretty easily. Uh, it's, it's just a rough, it's a, it's a rough, rough, uh, it's a rough, rough thing when, you know, the, the winner of the game isn't really determined by the skill of the actual duels they played but by the skill of reading whether their opponent is going to side into a counter to their strategy or not. It's basically all dependent on reads that happen outside of the gameplay itself. And for that reason, I think this format actually isn't the best at, you know, sort of the highest sort of, I'm going to play the most competitive deck that I can, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win with that deck. Because this deck is just like, not very fun to win with. I actually that's a lie. It is fun. It is fun just styling on your opponent, drawing all five Exodia pieces. 
but it just feels bad. Like it feels bad, you know, from a outside perspective, just like after you finish the games and you reflect on it and you're like, that was a kind of scummy win. That was, that was kind of degenerate, but you know, people enjoy that. And I, I do think it's worth actually experiencing once or twice uh, because there actually is some skill involved with this. It's not just, you know, sit on swords revealing light, sit on defenders until you draw Exodia pieces. There actually is some skill in, you know, knowing when to fire your swords revealing light, knowing when to trap hole, knowing what attacks to actually take, knowing when to chump lock with a, with a piece of Exodia and when to set a main in your bug. You know, there is some skill involved, and I do think that a matchup with this deck is not an instant win. Um, it just is a very likely win, uh, especially if you read the room right for games two and three. Uh, but, you know, that's that's Yu-Gi-Oh. You know, there are formats like this that are have kind of miserable top matches. And... Yeah, the game is still fun, I think. And it still teaches you a lot in this sort of proto form in terms of managing resources, managing, you know, what information you have on your opponent, uh, knowing when your opponent's bluffing versus not bluffing. Uh, so I do think that this format is still good to learn from for a new player. And... You know, especially if you're not playing this Exodia deck and instead you're playing the aggro mirror match. I actually do think that the bare bones aggro deck against a bare bones aggro deck is a very skill intensive matchup, uh, despite the sort of just high rolly cards like Raigeki and Dark Hole uh, that can really just put you over the top. I do think it's pretty skill intensive, and I will actually have a video of both a aggro mirror match and an Exodia versus aggro match, um, just to show you all, you know, what these sort of matches look like and what things to consider when you're playing them. I will, however, refuse to have an Exodia mirror match because those are boring. It is literally whoever draws Exodia first, no skill involved, which is uh, not. <laughs> Not an enjoyable experience, uh, let me tell you. So I won't have that, but I will have the other two matchups. And I hope that you enjoy them. Um, but before we get into that, and before we close off the video, I want to give my final thoughts. Actually, before we get into my final, final thoughts on this format, I want to cover one more sort of funny strategy you can do. So just like the Exodia deck smoke screened into aggro, you can actually do an aggro deck and smoke screen into Exodia, which is, is kind of funny. It can win you a game too. Um, Exodia is better when you actually go first because you're essentially one draw ahead of your opponent. Uh, so, you know, if you lose game one with this aggro deck, you could queue up Exodia game two and make it more likely that you'll win that and then just go back to aggro for game three. So that is a funny possibility. Um, the only thing is that this is a bit less good than the Exodia smoke screen, I think. Just because, like, the Exodia smoke screen gets into sort of side decking mind games that can really just, you know, if you mind game wrong with against the Exodia smoke screen, uh, you're just, you know, you're just screwed, basically. You can just lose the game on deck selection alone. Um, whereas here, that's a lot less likely. Uh, I will also say that Exodia is probably more likely to win game one in, in whatever game it plays because your opponent doesn't yet know. Um, like, if you just set a defender or something, your opponent doesn't yet know that you're on Exodia necessarily, and they might play in a way that they shouldn't at the beginning if they if they uh, don't know that. Um, so I do think the Exodia smokescreen is better. And I think that the basic aggro that can go into a sideboard that can beat Exodia 
is actually better than this. But I think this is a funny possibility to bring up. Uh, and, you know, it, if you want to be an aggro player who also does Exodia, you know, this is the deck for you, I think. Um, but, yeah, I, I thought I'd just bring that up. But now, now let's get into the actual final thoughts on the format. I know, I know, I said I'd go into my final thoughts, and this is the second time I said that. But, you know... I, I can't I can't stop talking about this set without talking about the sort of miscellaneous cards that didn't really deserve a spot to talk about in any of the previous sections, but I find very interesting for a variety of different reasons. Um, these you know these cards, not accepting like all the various normal monsters, they're just normal monsters with bad stats that I didn't talk about. These cards are sort of the last other unique cards that do things that no other cards do in the game at this point. Uh, so I, I just want to talk about them because you might be looking through the card pool and wonder, well, hey, what about these? These seem pretty good. Uh, so let me explain why they're not. Uh, Hain Hain, again, it is a bad card. Uh, it, it doesn't deprive your opponent of resources. It's just the worst man-eater bug. But... I wanted to put it here because I think it is somewhat interesting. Uh, and also I just wanted to say that, you know, some cards, and this is an example of one of them, some cards aren't necessarily written in the same form uh, with the colon, semicolon, and then after the semicolon, you know, broken up in that form because some cards have never been reprinted after a certain point. And the sort of way that the effects are written changed after a certain point to be much more readable. So with cards that have never gotten those reprints, they can have effects that are less clear. Luckily, Hain Hain's effect is very clear, but I just wanted to bring it up as an example of a card that, you know, is not written in that same way as something like a man Eater Bug is. Now, moving on to the actual new cards here. Uh, Reaper of the Cards is very, very interesting. Uh, it is basically Armed Ninja, but for trap cards, which is, you know, neat, right? Like, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to get rid of Trap Hole? Like, this seems like a good card, so why didn't I mention it? Well, the first big flaw is that it has five stars, which means that in order to set this face down, you have to tribute set it. Since this is the only monster you'd reasonably tribute set, because all other one tribute monsters have defenses less than 2,000, so why not just play a regular defender? If you tribute set this monster, your opponent will know that it's a Reaper of the Cards. Unless they just think you're doing something crazy with like a Curse of Dragon. So, you know, they don't have to attack into it because they don't want their trap hole to be destroyed by it. They can just use a dark hole or Raigeki or whatever. Uh, so they're not going to trigger this thing. You can trigger it yourself by flip summoning Reaper of the Cards and potentially hitting a trap hole that way. But if you flip this thing up to do that, that's a flip summon, and your opponent can just chain trap hole to it and actually destroy it Uh so that will get rid of the trap hole, you know, your opponent will be forced to use it on a less good monster. But, I mean, you've had to give up essentially two resources to get rid of one trap hole. It's not really worth playing. Um, you could argue that you could use it on the two other traps in the game, which we'll discuss soon. But frankly, those aren't worth considering. Now we get to the spells. Uh, Gravedigger Ghoul is a very interesting one because it's the only card in the set that banishes or you know removes from play, as it says. Uh, so banishing, or as it used to be called, removing from play, is basically you know putting a card in a location that's not the graveyard uh, and not the field, not the hand. It's basically nothing can actually access it. Um, so it's just out of the game, basically. Later down the line, there are ways to get things back from being banished or removed from play. 
but you know this is kind of interesting uh you can get rid of monsters from your opponent's graveyard that you don't want them using monster reborn on uh which i think i mentioned when i was talking about the side deck for exodia um so that's 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 cool but you know it's kind of a bad card in exodia or stall decks already and on top of that, if you use this in an aggro deck, you're depriving yourself of a monster that you can monster reborn. So it's it's interesting. It's not very good here, though. Pretty bad card. Not as bad as Remove Trap, though. Remove Trap is probably one of the most specific cards in this format. Uh, it's a spell card. You target one face-up trap on the field and destroy it. Sounds pretty good, right? until you reread it and realize that it can only target face up trap cards. The only card that this will be able to affect is Dragon Capture Jar. So, you know, Remove Trap can be really good in the side deck of a Dragon deck because, you know, you can bring it in to counteract your opponent's Dragon Capture Jars and let your dragons run wild. But it, all that does is kind of reduce it just to being a bad card for an already bad deck. So it's not really worth using. Uh, it is funny though. And it's mainly funny because, you know, while it will get more targets that it can be used on later, now it's just, it's just pure dragon capture jar hate. And the card is not good enough that it deserves just pure hate. So that's kind of funny. Moving on to the traps. These are a bit better than the monsters and spells, I think. They're still not very good though. Two-pronged attack probably has the most promise and also brings up the most ruling issues. Uh, not in terms of that the rulings are necessarily hard to discuss, but in that a lot of the things that I've mentioned as sort of niche cases, like replay in the battle phase uh, or chaining things, you know, two-pronged attack is something that drives a lot of those discussions because it's basically the only way you can do that sort of thing. Um, or trigger those sorts of situations. What it does is you select two of your monsters and one of your opponent's monsters, and then you destroy all three. Uh, this can be useful if your opponent, like, let's say they activate Raigeki, and you've got two monsters on the field. Well, if you chain two-pronged attack, you can destroy your two monsters and destroy one of theirs. So, you know, it kind of makes the Raigeki go down a bit easier. The only thing is that even in that ideal case, you've used up three cards to deal with two of your opponents, the Raigeki and whatever monster you destroy. That's not necessarily the best trade. In addition, if you're not using it for those sorts of ideal situations, you just used three cards to get rid of one of your opponents. So it's not really the best trade. Uh, you can include it. There's probably niche situations where, like, you're like, man, I really wish I had a two-pronged attack. Uh, so you could include it in your deck if you want. Uh, it's just generally bad, and generally you just want some other form of removal instead. But it is one of the only other ways to interact with your opponent on their turn. Lastly, we have Dragon Capture Jar, which I previously used for the example of a continuous trap. Uh, because it's the only continuous trap in the game, and thus the only target for remove trap. Dragon Capture Jar is just pure dragon hate, so all dragon monsters on the field switch to defense mode when it's activated and stay there. And note that this applies even if you summon another dragon monster, Dragon Capture Jar will change it to defense mode, even after it's been already activated on the field, um, because its effect is a continuous effect. Now, this is very good against dragon decks, but dragon decks are pretty bad. So it's kind of like, I'd honestly say that even against dragon decks, it's not really worth siding this in because you can probably just beat a dragon deck with your basic removal. And the basic removal will be helpful in more situations than dragon capture jar will. But, you know, it is funny. It is funny. It, it's very much just a product of the anime and manga just like all those big dragons that were getting summoned out against like Kaiba. You know, this thing wrecked Kaiba's blue eyes, I think at one point. Um, 
So that's that's why it's there. But it's just a funny inclusion to consider in in respect to the overall card pool. But okay, I I just had to get that off my chest. I had to discuss these cards because frankly they're probably never getting discussed again. They're not good in this format and other formats just make the game a lot, you know, give the game a lot more powerful cards. So these are likely not to come up in those formats. So I wanted to, you know, sort of shine a spotlight on them before they're cast in the annals of Yu-Gi-Oh's jank history. So, yeah. Anyways, I should probably get you to my actual final thoughts and not just keep teasing you like this. So now that the jank is done, now that the actual good strategies are discussed, now that, you know, basically the entire card pool of the format is out of the way, let's finally get to my final thoughts. Okay, as, as I said, you know, before multiple times, I don't actually think this format is very good. I do think that, you know, some of the aggro mirror matches can be fun. I think that, you know, it can be, this format can be good at teaching certain skills that will come in handy later on in the game and also just apply to other card games in general. For instance, like card management, you know, bluffing, uh, knowing when to use certain cards and effects. Uh, just, I, I think that there's a lot this format can teach, but gameplay wise, if you're able to use every card at three at the top level, uh, the decks are going to be pretty bad, pretty degenerate. And the gameplay is not going to be the best outside of like the aggro mirror, which even then, you know, most people I don't think will necessarily get the most enjoyment out of it. But, you know, I think we're giving the first set of Yu-Gi-Oh a bit of an unfair shake, uh, given the context of what we're doing versus the context of what the game was doing originally. First of all, we've got to understand that, you know, the OCG, the original card game version that's released in Japan, released it with different packs and initially even with different rules. Uh, those different packs that we didn't get, you know, made certain cards a lot better, right? Like, originally the monster with the highest attack in the first pack was Hitatsume Giant with 1,200 attack which, you know, Skull Redbird, Urabian, like, blow out of the water. Um, so, of course, here, Hitatsume Giant and other monsters with 1,200 attack are not going to be as good as they were in the very first sets of the OCG. In addition, you know, we've got to consider that we're looking at this from a perspective of just using, being able to use any of these cards in how, whatever quantity, quantity we want to when... You know, back in the day, if you're pulling these from packs, no one is going out and buying singles of these cards. No one's going to, you know, when the packs first come out, buy three copies of all the Exodia pieces. Because they were all ultra rare. So it's very unlikely that you'd even meet one person with one of each piece, let alone three of each piece. In addition, that applied to other cards, like Monster Reborn was an ultra rare, Raigeki, Dark Hole, Swords, Trap Hole, Man Your Bug, those were all super rares. So you're not likely to have found someone who actually had multiple copies of these. They might have one and be able to use that one copy against you at a key moment, and it would be pretty awesome because you're like, whoa, that's such a cool card uh, that you managed to pull. And that would be pretty cool and fun, but ultimately, you're not going to be able to have access to the vast amount of removal that makes things like the tribal strategies less good. In addition, you know, you're not going to have access to every monster in the pool as well. And that really lets the tribal strategies sort of shine. Because even if you have subpar monsters by our standards, you know, there's a flavor to that. There's a bit of fun in being able to build, you know... Uh, a beast deck or a thunder deck or something, you know? Um, there's, there's a lot of elements to this that 
don't really show through at sort of like the constructed LOB level that we're playing these games at. And that I really think would show through better if you play it in a limited format. Um, other YouTubers have played this, this format in limited. Like look at the progression series with that opening episode. Uh, Sealed Showdown also did that. Many YouTubers have also just, you know, sort of done their own versions of progression series. And in each of those, this this set is a lot more bearable. Like, neither player has access to Exodia, most likely. Neither player has, you know, every single big blowout card. It's more like, whoa, what did you get? Did you get Raigeki? Oh, that's so cool. You know, people are playing subpar cards, like, I don't know, Tripwire Beast or something, or Fire Yari, just because they didn't get all the good ones, you know? So... I think in limited format, this can actually be a lot more fun in a different way. Uh, and I think that's what it was originally designed for. Besides just, you know, oh, kids like this this uh, Saturday morning cartoon from Japan. You know, let's just make stuff for them to buy, you know, and have fun with. Uh, and, you know, not sort of expecting actual thought to be put into these decks and actual thought to be put into the strategies that are the most optimal. So I do think you got to look at this format for what it is, which is basically a twisted version of what the, uh, what the manufacturers intended it to be. Uh, but still, you know, if we're looking at it from that perspective, constructed wise, this format is terrible to play. Uh, I will say, in my opinion, despite having some good elements to it, some good gameplay in certain matches, you know, it's just not the best format. But hopefully the next set of cards released in Structure Deck Yugi and Kaiba will bring a bit of a better, you know, more interactive element to the game, right? 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 <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this behemoth of a video. I hope it was enjoyable and that it helped give you the tools to play this format for yourself. If you want to see more content like this, please be sure to subscribe. The next guide will be covering the release of Structure Deck's Yugi and Kaiba, both of which shook up the game quite a bit and laid the groundwork for what is currently one of the more popular retro formats. But before I get to that, I'll be making some shorter videos featuring different deck matchups in LOB format to give some examples of what games in this format can look like. If there's any other LOB format content you'd like to see, please let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know if you liked the length of this video or if you'd prefer me to split up the guides in the future. I'm still figuring out what format works best for this sort of content, so any feedback is greatly appreciated. Until next time, this is YGO from Zero, signing off.